My name is Abhishek Mishra, and I'm going to talk to you about how you can integrate your email sending app with SES. Um, shortly after that, Morgan will be up here to do a deep dive on how to build a robust notification processor that leverages AWS. And they'll have a guest speaker here to talk about how you can prioritize and send the right email for your customers. So how do you get started with SES? Well, the very first step is to verify with us the email address that you're going to send your emails from. Now, the reason we ask you to do this is to ensure that you're a legitimate email sender that is allowed to send mail from that address. And by ensuring that only legitimate senders are using our platform, we help improve deliverability for all of our senders. Um, so the way you do this, uh, you go into the SES console, and you'll see a, a, a form just like the one you see up there. And you can type in an email address and click the button, and we'll shoot you an email with a link in it. Once you click the link, that address is now verified with us. Now, you may also want to verify an entire domain that we can send from a host of addresses on that domain. Um, to do this, you would initiate the process the same way by going into the console. But when you hit the button here to verify the domain after you've typed it in, we'll actually give you a DNS record for you to publish via your DNS provider. Now, once you go ahead and publish those records, SES will shortly thereafter automatically recognize the existence of those records. And uh, as a result, that domain will be verified with us. And then you can start sending emails from any address on that domain. And uh, you know, if you want to go ahead and, and test out if everything's working, one way to do that is to go into the console, and there's a send test email form, like the one you see up there. We just ask for a few basic parameters, like subject, body, et cetera, and you can go ahead and shoot yourself an email and ensure that it's, it's getting delivered. Uh, the next step, of course, is to connect your application with SES and actually give us those email requests that you want to send through us. There's two major ways to do this. Um, the first way, and probably the fastest way for many of you, would be to point your existing infrastructure, that is the MTAs that you use to deliver mail, to the SMTP endpoint of SES. And uh, this lets you use SES for delivery without having to write a new, uh, new application. The other way, of course, is to use the query interface that SES offers, uh, that is our HTTP API. And uh, no matter which way you use HTTP or SMTP, you're still going to get the same features and, and you're interacting with the same service. All right, so one thing to keep in mind is uh, once you start sending mails, you should, rec you should expect that you'll get some notifications from us about uh, events such as bounces and complaints. And uh, we're actually going to do a deep dive on this shortly, so uh, just hang tight for now, and then we'll get back to it in a little bit. So let's talk about how you can scale your email sending on top of SES. One of the first things that we recommend if you're a sender on top of SES is to set up email authentication. Now, as you are sending more and more mail, it is more crucial that you prove to recipients, that is ISPs as well as your end users, that your mail is legitimate. And uh, there's a number of technologies in this space that can help you do that. The main one that we're going to talk about here is uh, Domain Keys Identified Mail, or DKIM for short. Uh, DKIM is an email authentication standard that lets you add a cryptographic signature to your emails. And uh, using the signature, a recipient can then validate that you are a legitimate sender. And they can prove certain things about your email. Uh, for example, a recipient can prove that the sender of email is actually allowed to send from that domain in a strong cryptographic manner. They can prove that the email has not been altered or tampered with during transit uh, before it got to them. And lastly, uh, you know, signing your emails with DKIM also lets ISPs associate email reputation with your domain. And, uh, and the reason this is important is they're more strongly able to prove that you're actually the legitimate sender representing that domain and sending email from that domain. And of course, as you send better and better mail, that's going to help improve your deliverability as well. Now, we actually have a, uh, a blog post series on this particular topic of DKIM. Uh, and so if you guys um, you know, head over to the SES official blog, I, I highly recommend you check out that series. So how do you actually set up DKIM on top of SES? If you head over to the console, uh, we, we call it Easy DKIM. We have a, a, a page that will let you do this. And essentially, what we give you are three DNS CNAME records. And these records are, again, similar to the verification process for a domain. Uh, these are DNS records that you'll need to publish through your provider. And, and once you do that, SES will actually detect their existence and send you an email saying, hey, we now see these records. And, and at that point, you can return to the console and check a box to say, start signing my mails. At that point, all of the email requests that you've been sending to SES will start to get signed uh, by us on your behalf. Now, if you guys are hosting DNS with Amazon Route 53 and you're using that same AWS account uh, with SES, 
then we can actually publish those records on your behalf right out of the console without you having to do it. So um, one other thing I want to note about using DKIM on top of SES, you can certainly sign your own emails ahead of time and then send those requests to SES and we'll still deliver them. But there's actually some good reasons for you to let us sign the email on your behalf. And, uh, and one of them is that we will do automatic key rotation for you. This is where, periodically, we'll actually rotate the public-private key pair that's associated with your uh, cryptographic signing for DKIM without you having to intervene. And as a result, we provide a, a stronger level of security around these cryptographic signatures. Uh, let's walk through how this works real quick. So first, you, the sender, give us an email request to send. And SES will then go ahead and compute a DKIM signature and add it to the email, thus producing a signed email. Like with all emails, it'll then find its way over to the ISP, uh, and the ISP will then want to validate, because there's a signature there, they'll, they'll want to validate the signature and know that you are actually authenticated to send from that domain. They'll do this by first fetching the public DKIM key associated with that signature, and at that point, they're able to validate that it is actually a valid email. Now, sometime later, SES will go ahead and rotate those keys, and we'll publish a new set of records into DNS. And, uh, and then you might give us a second email to send. Just like before, we will sign the email, and it'll make its way over to the ISP. The ISP will reach out into DNS and fetch a, a public DKIM key that's associated with that signature, and now they're able to validate this second email. But what about that first email? Let's say that the first email was delayed, or for whatever reason, the ISP wants to revalidate at a later time. They're actually able to still do this. And the reason they're able to still do this is we asked you to publish three CNAME records for, for the DKIM signing. And this lets us keep the old keys around after we start using the new keys. And therefore, old emails will be still, can still be validated for some period of time, even though we're now using the new keys. And so this is a, a, a cool benefit of using uh, our DKIM signatures instead of pre-signing the mails before you give your request to us. So. Now you've gone ahead and set up email authentication. The next step is to set up a reliable feedback processing system. Um, and as I mentioned before, we're actually going to do a deep dive on this topic. We're going to cover things like how you configure it, what you do with these notifications. And so just stay tuned for a few moments, and then we'll get back to it. All right, the next step is to plan ahead for sending limit increases. And, uh, and the first step in knowing what your limits are, increasing those limits with SES, is to monitor your sending and know how much you're sending. Um, we, actually, we actually offer four different metrics right now, deliveries, bounces, complaints, and rejected emails, which are emails that SES will not deliver. Um, we display those graphically, and as you see in the screenshot here in the console, but you can also pull them through our APIs and consume them programmatically. Um, once you know how much email you're sending, it's a good idea to compare that to the, the amount of email you're allowed to send. Now, every account on SES has two limits associated with it. And you can find this in the console. You can also find it in the API, the two limits being the daily sending quota. This is the volume of email that you're allowed to send on any given day, and uh, the maximum send rate, which is the per second email rate that you'd be throttled at. Um, knowing these limits and comparing them to, to your actual sending will let you know if you need to increase your limits. And to do that, you can actually follow a link from our public documentation, which will take you over to a, a form like this to request an increase in your limits. Uh, of course, we, we recommend that you do this well in advance of ever reaching the limits, just so your continuity, your business continuity, is not affected. Um, this form has a, a few basic questions about your email and the limits you're requesting. Typically, we try to turn these around within 24 hours, so it's pretty quick. So let's say you've gone ahead and uh, monitored your sending, realized you needed a greater limit. You put in that request, we turned it around, and now you have a higher limit. Now it's probably a good idea to make sure that your email application is actually able to scale up and give us those requests at that increased high rate. Now, there are a few ways to do scalability testing in email. What we certainly do not want you to do is to send email to a bunch of random made-up addresses on the internet, because that will probably get you, know, get you in trouble deliverability-wise. And so instead, we offer a, a feature we call the Mailbox Simulator. And all the Mailbox Simulator is is actually a series of email addresses that you can send email to freely. And these email addresses are, uh, are available in our documentation, and they do different things. Some of them simulate a successful delivery. Some of them will simulate a bounce or a complaint. And so you can use this to go ahead and test your application without using your sending quota or contributing to your bounce complaint metrics. And so it's a great way to load test your application as well. 
And when you do load testing, there's a couple key things to keep in mind. Um, you need to essentially replicate the real use case of email that you have in production. And so that means monitoring the email sizes that you're actually sending in production and load testing with those same sizes. It also means sending emails at the same volumes that you would in production just to make sure everything is appropriately scaled up. Lastly, I want to note that you also want to ensure that your feedback processing system is also scaled up and is able to handle the increased load in addition to just your core sending application. So let's say you went ahead and did that scalability testing, and now you find out that your application is not able to send those emails quickly. What are some things they could do to tune your application and get those emails out? The first thing that we recommend to our users is to actually consider using the HTTP endpoint instead of SMTP, that is using our query API. And, uh, and the reason we recommend this is uh, SMTP is actually a very chatty protocol. What I mean by that is each email request from your mail servers to our SMTP endpoint requires multiple round trips between our servers. And this, of course, is somewhat inefficient. Now, if you compare that to using the query API, it's really one request response round trip. Now, whether you use SMTP or HTTP, we recommend that you use persistent connections. And what I mean by that is that you reuse connections to send multiple requests instead of doing something like tearing down the connection after each request and then building a brand new one up. Lastly, you'll definitely want to consider sending in parallel, which means re-architecting your application potentially to use multiple processes, multiple threads. And depending on the scale you're operating at, you'll also want to distribute that across many hosts so that you're able to fully use your sending quota with us. Cool, so what did we talk about? We first talked about setting up DKIM authentication for your emails, and uh, we talked about the importance of a reliable feedback processing system, and we'll cover that in a little bit. We talked about how to monitor your sending, how to check your sending limits, and how to increase those limits with us. We also talked about how you can do scalability testing with a mailbox simulator, and finally, we talked about some things you can do to tweak your application in order to maximize the throughput of your email sending. Now I'd like to invite up Morgan Thomas from the SES team to do a deep dive into how you can build a robust notification processor. Thanks. Thanks, Abhi. Hey, guys. I'm Morgan Thomas, and I'm a software development engineer on the Amazon SES team. And uh, today, I'm going to tell you a little bit about how you can use email notifications to improve your sending with SES. I'm going to start by giving you an introduction into what email notifications are, uh, the different types we offer, and importantly, why you want them. Um, then I'm going to show you how you can set up a notification processor leveraging other AWS services. So what are email notifications? Well, put simply, they are a source of feedback about the email you send. SES offers three different types. Bounce, complaint, and delivery notifications. You can choose to receive them either via email or via Amazon's simple notification service, SNS. Amazon SNS is a service that allows you to push messages to distributed services via a handful of protocols, such as HTTP or Amazon's simple queue service. So in this talk, we're going to focus on receiving notifications via Amazon SNS because it offers easy programmatic consumption compared to email. So, why do you want these notifications? Well, they offer you increased visibility into your sending with SES. For example, delivery notifications enable you to know the instant your email is delivered. They make it easy to offer an improved customer experience, ensuring that only your customers who wish to receive your email do. They help you maintain a good sending reputation with ISPs. This is because mail servers may treat your email favorably if they notice you are acting on bounces and complaints you receive. And finally, Notifications can be used as a source of feedback about the email you send, alerting you to specific email campaigns that may have been less desirable amongst your cu customers. So let's talk about the first type, bounces. So bounces are reported from receiving mail server when delivery fails. They represent undeliverable email. SES will classify your bounces into three different categories, permanent, transient, and undetermined. Permanent bounces indicate that you should no longer send email to a particular recipient. This is because all future email attempts will likely fail for that recipient. For example, if you receive a bounce due to an invalid recipient email address, it's likely you'll receive the same bounce for any future email sent to that address. Transient bounces, on the other hand, represent failed delivery attempts to an email address, which will likely be able to receive email successfully in the future. 
For example, an email that fails due to a full recipient inbox has a high chance of succeeding if retried again. Or if you receive a bounce due to a message being too large, you may be able to reduce the message size before sending again. So, and finally, undetermined bounces represent bounces that SES was unable to classify in one of the previous two categories. This can happen if SES receives a non-standard bounce from an ISP and is unable to parse and classify that bounce. So in summary, we recommend that you stop sending to addresses that generate permanent bounces. For transient bounces, it depends. And for undetermined bounces, we recommend that you manually review them. The next type is complaints. Complaints are reported from receiving mail server when a user marks a message as spam in their email client. SES has feedback loops with ISPs, which enable us to receive these complaints and forward them to you, an SES customer. Complaints represent unwanted email, so we recommend that you stop sending to the addresses that generate them. Next is delivery notifications. New to SES this year, this was a big customer request. Delivery notifications enable you to know the instant that SES hands off your email to a receiving mail server. In addition to delivery timestamp, the notifications contain other useful information, such as the response message of the remote mail server that accepted your email. We're seeing some cool use cases for this feature, such as using the notifications to help track time-sensitive emails. So let's take a look at how these notifications commonly flow. Here's a SES customer making a send email API request. SES will deliver the email on behalf of the customer. Upon successful delivery, SES will issue a delivery notification to an SNS topic of the customer's choice. Let's say the recipient of the email marks the message as spam. SES will receive a complaint from the ISP, which will then forward as a complaint notification to the SNS topic of a customer's choice. This can be either the same SNS topic used for other notification types or a separate SNS topic. So let's examine what the notifications look like. You'll notice they're in the JSON format, which allows easy programmatic consumption. This one in particular is a bounce. Each notification type will have some information specific to that type. For example, bounce type and bounce subtype. This one is a transient bounce of subtype mailbox full. This indicates that SES was able to classify the bounce it received and determine that the bounce represented an email that was unable to be delivered due to a full recipient inbox. This classification by SES makes it really easy for your application to process and act on these notifications without having to parse bounce messages. Finally, each notification will contain a mail object, which contains identifying information, helping you to relate the notification back to the SES request that generated it. For example, the message ID shown here is the message ID that was returned to the customer when they made a request to SES. So now I'm going to show you how you can set up a notification processor uh, leveraging AWS services such as Elastic Beanstalk. This application is going to consume and process bounces and complaints. Depending on the type of notification, it's going to perform some action, such as remove the customer from a mailing list uh, in the case of permanent bounces. For some bounces, such as mailbox full bounces, we may want to temporarily suspend sending to the customer to give them time to clean out their inbox. Finally, for some notifications, we may send them to a human for manual review. So here's an overview of the steps I'm going to take. I'm going to start by creating an SNS topic where I will receive these notifications at. I'm then going to create an Amazon Simple Queue service queue and subscribe it to the SNS topic. Doing this provides a level of durability and temporary message storage, allowing my application to process the notifications at its leisure. I'll then create an Elastic Beanstalk worker tier application, which will consume messages from our queue and host our Python code, which is processing the notifications. Finally, I'll walk you through some example Python application, which shows how you can process the JSON objects and update an email list. So let's get started. I'm going to create an SNS topic and an SQS queue. I'm then going to subscribe the queue to the topic, which will result in a setup similar to this. When SES receives a complaint or a bounce, it's going to forward it to our new SNS topic. Our SNS topic will then push that notification out to our queue. So I'm going to switch over to a web browser here and show you what this looks like real quick. Great, so I'm going to start here in the SES dashboard of the AWS console. 
I'm going to navigate over here to the verified senders list, where I'll select either the email address or domain that I want to configure settings for. I can go down here and hit Edit Configuration, and we'll notice that I don't currently have an SNS topic set up for bounces or complaints. I can create a new SNS topic easily from within the SES console. Next, I'll go to the Bounce dropdown and select the topic we just created, and do the same for complaints. Now that we have bounces and complaints going to an SNS topic, we're going to navigate to the Amazon Simple Queue Service dashboard, where we're going to create a new queue. I'm going to name this SES Notifications Queue and stick with the defaults here. Next, we want to subscribe our queue to our SNS topic. I can do so by going up to Queue Actions and hitting Subscribe Queue to SNS Topic. We'll see the topic we just created in the dropdown, and we can hit Subscribe. Subscribing your queue to your topic this way ensures that the appropriate permissions are in place, allowing your topic to push messages to your queue. Great, so we've just completed the first two steps of our solution. We have our notifications going to a queue. I'm now going to set up an Elastic Beanstalk worker to your application to consume the messages from our queue. Here's an overview of what this uh, solution will look like after we're done with this step. We're going to have Elastic Beanstalk managing an EC2 instance running our Python code. We'll process messages from our queue, parse the notification, and update our email list when necessary. In this example, my email list is stored in a PostgreSQL database hosted on Amazon Relational Database Service. I'm going to show you what the Elastic Beanstalk creation process looks like, because it's pretty easy. So from the Elastic Beanstalk console, I'm going to hit Create New Application. I'm going to call it SES Feedback Processor. And we're going to configure some details of the environment. I'm going to select the worker tier. This is different than a traditional Elastic Beanstalk application that serves web pages in that it's going to pull messages from a queue and perform some work on them. This is perfect for our use case. Next, I'm going to select Python as the configuration for this example, but you'll notice there are many other options. Finally, I've determined that a single instance is enough for my use case, but if you notice that a single instance does not adequately handle the volume of notifications you're getting, it's easy to come back and leverage autoscaling's integration with Elastic Beanstalk to manage multiple instances. I'm then going to upload my application, which is a zip file containing my Python code. I'll go into some details of what's in this uh, Python code here in a few minutes. Um, but for now, I'm going to upload this and hit Next. We can go with the default name for environment, and then we also don't need any additional resources at this time, although I recommend you launching your environment inside an existing VPC if you have one. Finally, I'm going to configure some details about the instance type. In this example, I'm going to stick with the default, but there are a wide range of instance types that may suit your application better. Next, I'll select the instance profile. This is the IAM role, which will be launched with each of our EC2 instances in our application. This role is going to give our instance permissions to read and write from our SQS queue and to publish metrics to CloudWatch. I'm going to skip through the tag section. And finally, we're going to configure some details of our worker. We're going to select the queue we recently created as the input queue for our worker to pull messages from. Next, we'll configure the HTTP path. The way the Elastic Beanstalk worker tier works is that there's a daemon running on our EC2 instance pulling messages from our queue and posting them to our application via HTTP. So this is the URL that we're going to expect our SQS messages at. Finally, we can review everything we just did and launch our application. It's going to take a few minutes to launch our Elastic Beanstalk app, so I'm going to switch back to the presentation. And now we have our notifications being pushed to a queue and being processed by our Python code running on Elastic Beanstalk worker tier. So I'm going to show you uh, a little bit about our Python code, which processes the JSON notifications and updates our email list. Here's an overview of what's going on. Elastic Beanstalk is going to get a message from the queue and post it to our Python application. We're then going to parse the notification, determine the type, and depending on the type, we may update our email list or send it off to a human for manual review. When we're done processing the message, we're going to return a success response 
letting Elastic Beanstalk know it's safe to delete the message from our queue. So here's an overview of the meat of, uh, of the Python application I'm using here. We're going to leverage the Flask framework to set up a lightweight HTTP server. This annotation is specifying that we want to receive post requests at the slash process URL. This is the same URL I just configured our Elastic Beanstalk application to post our SQS messages to. Next, we're going to load the message as a JSON object to make it easier to parse and begin by looking at the notification type. We know for permanent bounces, we want to remove the recipients from our list so that we don't send them any more email. For transient bounces, we can look at the bounce subtype. For bounces with a subtype of mailbox full, we're going to temporarily suspend sending to them so that the recipient has time to clean out their inbox. For other transient bounces, we're going to send them to a human for manual review. Similarly, for bounces that are neither permanent nor transient, we're going to send them off to a human for manual review. It's important to have a catch-all like this because SES may add additional bounce types in the future. Finally, for complaints, we're going to do something similar to permanent bounces and remove those recipients from our list. When we're done processing the notification, we're going to return a 200 response, letting Elastic Beanstalk know it's safe to delete the message from our queue. So we've just completed all the steps in, in our solution. So how do we know if it works? Well, I'm going to leverage the SES mailbox simulator to generate some sample bounces and complaints, which will hopefully be picked up by our processor. So let me show you a brief demo of what this is going to look like. So I mentioned previously that I have an email list stored in a PostgreSQL database. I'm going to run a simple select all command showing you the contents of my email list. Here's the recipients that we normally send email to. In this example, we're going to focus on the last one, complaint at simulator.amazonses.com. This is going to represent a customer of ours who's going to mark our message as spam when they receive an email from us. When that happens, we should expect to receive a complaint notification, which will get picked up by our notification processor, which will then notice that it is a complaint, and so it will remove the recipient from our email list. So I'm going to make a sample SES request using the AWS command line interface. This makes a simple send email API request to SES with a basic subject and body. We're going to get a message ID back, which indicates that SES successfully processed our message and is now sending it out. If I switch back to the database, I should be able to run the same command, and we'll notice the recipient's now gone, indicating that our processor processed that complaint successfully. And with that, I'm happy I could show you some use cases for notifications with SES and how you can quickly set up a notification processor leveraging AWS services such as Elastic Beanstalk. Next up, I'm going to introduce Sina from Amazon.com's email marketing platform. Sina is going to share with you some of the strategies that Amazon.com uses to send the right email for its customers. Thank you. Thank you, Morgan. Hi, everyone. My name is Sina Yagana, and I'm a technical program manager with Amazon.com uh, email marketing platform. Today, I'll be talking about how Amazon.com sends, uh, sends and prioritizes their marketing messages. But before I get started, I want to talk a little bit about why I'm here. First off, Amazon.com is a very large email sender. We are also an Amazon SES user. Because of these two reasons, we've been invited by SES here to talk a little bit about our methodologies of how we send marketing messages. So what kind of messages do we send at Amazon.com? First off, we send about a million uh, transactional messages per hour. These messages are like ship shipment confirmations or purchase confirmations. We also send marketing messages uh, where we try to batch and send these emails as quickly as possible. I'll be mostly talking about the marketing side of things today. Finally, we don't only send for Amazon.com, but we also send for a couple of our subsidiaries, such as MyHabit, Zappos, uh, and Audible. So what do we need in an email system? Well, first off, we want to make sure that we send all of our emails. Uh, it's extremely important to make sure that, all of our, that we have a reliable system to send our messages, as we know the opportunity cost of every message that we don't send. We also want to be able to scale up and scale down uh, the messages that we send, um, both the throughput and the volume. Our business changes on the, every single day, and we want to be able to be, have the flexibility to move along with it. Finally. 
we want to make sure that every single message that we send ends up, on the, ends up in the customer's inbox. This is actually a really tough problem, and it's really nice to have someone else handle that for you. Onboarding with SES makes it so we don't have to worry about that. So today I want to talk a little bit about how Amazon.com does its email marketing or, and its email marketing platform architecture, aka how we send emails and how we prioritize those messages. In the latter half of my talk, I want to talk a little bit about uh, our marketing experimentation and metrics. For example, what A-B tests we run and how we use metrics to ensure that we're sending the best message for our customers. So for our marketing messages, I said we send a lot of messages. We send about 75 to 250 million marketing messages every single day. That's about 20 terabytes worth of data. We leverage SES notifications in order for, for our feedback processing and to make sure that we're sending the right messages. And finally, our rate of send is about 30 million per hour. We set this cap because of our business needs, but we have the flexibility to change this cap anytime we need to. So I want to talk a bit about a problem that we found when we wanted to solve or send messages at a high volume. Uh, so in a basic system, each merchandiser chooses the message content in the customers. Each customer will then get every single message that's targeted for them. I want to define what a merchandiser is at Amazon.com. A merchandiser at Amazon.com, every department has a, a marketing merchandiser, and these are the people who are setting up the email campaigns. So to illustrate why this is a problem, I'm going to go ahead and go through an example. We have a shoes merchandiser and a book merchandiser that wants to set up an email marketing message. They go ahead and set up their campaigns, and then they send their message to every single customer that they've targeted. What this means is that certain, certain people are going to get multiple messages for that day. A common solution to solve this problem is to have some sort of scheduling where books merchandisers, for example, send on a Wednesday and shoes merchandisers send on a Thursday. However, uh, it's, not the it's not the best way to solve this problem as we have, uh, it's not the best message that we can send to the customer. And more importantly, Amazon.com is very big. Our customers are interested in a multiple, multitude of different departments. For example, a books, a, someone who enjoys books may also enjoy um, shoes, automotives, etc. And just going to the Amazon.com website, you can see we have a lot of different departments that we sell things on. Each one of these departments actually has a merchandiser that's creating campaigns, and because of that, each customer on average is targeted for seven different campaigns every single day. So how do we solve this problem? Well, let's go through how we actually currently send mail. We have merchandisers and our automation teams creating campaigns uh, that we then store in Amazon S3. Our automation teams create emails based on customer behaviors such as abandoned cart messages or view follow-up messages. From S3, we then have something called the planner, which determines what's the best message to send to each customer. We then commit that plan to Amazon S3, we then render, and then we send using SES. Let's focus on the planner, because that's the, that's the component that actually solved the problem that I was illustrating earlier. So in our distributed marketing system, the merchandiser sets up the targeting and the content, but then the planner then determines what's the best message to send to the customer. This ensures that the customer only gets the best marketing message. So going back to our previous uh, example, we have the shoes and books merchandisers. They do the exact same thing, but instead of just sending it directly to the customer, they're actually feeding their messages into our planner, and then the planner determines what's the best message. This is very efficient and good for a lot of reasons. Uh, first off, uh, the merchandisers have their own marketing strategy, and they're able to execute on their strategy. They're autonomous departments, and they have their own way that they want to send their message, and we're still able to not disrupt that workflow. So let's dive a little bit deeper in how the planner actually works. So I'm going to go through all the steps that the planner takes. First off, the merchandisers upload their targeted customer list to Amazon S3. Second, we use Amazon Elastic MapReduce to figure out what's the top valued message. And finally, we commit that result to the Amazon S3 for rendering, and then we send with SES. So going step by step, first we upload the campaigns. The merchandisers and the automated teams will then upload their, uh, upload their campaigns to Amazon S3 with a list of recipients that are intended to receive that campaign. From there, uh, we then look at every single campaign. Campaigns have metadata associated with them. For example, a book's campaign can have its genre or whether it's available on Kindle as part of its metadata. And we use Hadoop distributed cache on Elastic MapReduce to store this information on every single node in the cluster. 
Each recipient also has some metadata associated with it. For example, uh, has this person bought a books, books has, has this person bought a book in the last couple days, or are they a prime member? Taking all of this information, we want to take the recipient and map it to each campaign, as well as ca uh, map the recipient to, each, uh, to its own metadata. When we reduce this, we see that each recipient will then have every, ca every eligible campaign and its metadata. So processing this reduced data, we, we process this reduced data using recipient and campaign metadata. So taking the campaign metadata and the recipient metadata, we then use prioritization logic or an algorithm to figure out what's the best way to actually send this, or what's the best email to actually send to this customer. We then do this for every single recipient, and we commit this plan to Amazon S3. The key takeaways from this is that we still have our distributed marketing, but we have a centralized planner that determines what's the best message to send to each customer. We typically only send one marketing message per customer per day. And finally, we use Amazon Elastic MapReduce and Amazon S3 for our planning. So now that we have a system in place on how we actually send our marketing messages, uh, a common question that we often receive from our merchandisers is, how can we improve our message? Common questions that we receive are, can we improve our content? How can we improve our content? Can we improve our targeting? Should we even send this message? Luckily, there's a very simple answer to all of these questions. Using A-B experimentation, you're able to figure out whether you're sending the optimal message. So there are certain types of, or different types of uh, A-B experiments that we can do. For content, we offer multiple templates to each of our merchandisers, so they can actually have the same email campaign sent out with different, different content. What this allows them to do is actually compare their experimental content with their control and be able to see whether the new content is better than the old. We also offer a feature known as staggered sending, which allows, people to, or, which allows them to set up the experiment, and then we automatically scale up or scale down how much we send on that experiment. Another thing that we can do is actually affect the planner itself. The planner is using an algorithm to figure out what's the best message to send, and we can actually use machine learning or other methods to actually fine tune how we decide what's the best message. Finally, uh, for, the same camp for one campaign, someone has a, a certain target or a group of customers that they want to target, and they want to figure out, is that, the right, is that the right group of people to target? Targeting A-B testing is actually a little bit more difficult than explain, so I'm going to actually run through a quick example about it. So for example, we have a shoes campaign for, uh, that targets customers who bought shoes within the last six months. We, want, we noticed that this campaign is actually doing quite well, and we want to know if there, we can either grow our targeting list or if we should change our targeting at all. So the question would be, should we change this targeting to be customers who bought shoes within four to 10 months? So to do this, I'm going to go ahead and put up a Venn diagram. Uh, on the left side, we have uh, the people who have bought, a group of people who have bought shoes within the last six months. And on the right side, people who have bought it within four to 10 months. Most people would just want to split it down the middle and maybe do an A-B test. Let's go ahead and put some, uh, some, uh, some numbers in there. We'll say that A is making five cents a mail and B send, uh, send, or is making three cents per mail. Does that mean that A is a better target than B? Not necessarily, actually. And in, in order to actually explain why that's the case, I have to explain the concept of a holdout group. So traditionally, what a holdout group means is that there's a targeted group of people who will receive the message that they're targeted for, but the holdout group actually does not receive that message. At Amazon.com, since we have the planner, we're actually able to have a better holdout group by sending the next best message. So at Amazon.com, which is a little different than most other, other places, uh, the population, if we do a 50% holdout, 50% of the population will receive the message, and then 50% of the holdout group will receive the next best message. So in our example, we're making five cents a mail for, for, for our A targeting, but we notice that the holdout's making six cents a mail we can see that incrementally, we're actually not sending the best message to those customers. With our planner, it's actually quite easy to do, uh, to implement our holdout groups. I wrote up some pseudocode over here, but the main gist of it is that if you take a hash of the recipient and take a look at the experimentation uh, hash range, and you notice that the recipient isn't in that range, then we can just remove the recipient and campaign ID in the uh, pair in the, in the planner. We use a hash because it allows, us to, it allows us to actually keep those treatment groups for if we want to do a long-standing experiment or if we want to do multiple experiments with the same targeting group. So let's go back to our, to our uh, targeting example earlier, except this time let's add a holdout group. So previously we wanted to compare A versus B, but now let's go ahead and throw some values into our holdout groups as well. So 
now we want to uh, actually calculate the incremental value for A and the incremental value for B. So to do this, we take the value of A, which is making five cents a mail, and subtract it with the value of the A holdout, which is six cents per mail. So the incremental value for sending to that targeting group is negative one cent a mail. The incremental for value for B is uh, we take three cents per mail for B and we subtract it with its holdout, which is one cent, and we get two cents a mail. So what does this mean? This means that incrementally, B is a better campaign than A, and therefore we should use group B for our targeting. Let's go ahead and change our example one last time, uh, except this time let's assume that A is making seven cents a mail. So B stays the same, but A is actually making one cent a mail. Should we send to A or should we send to B? Actually, the answer is that we should set, use both groups for our targeting, because both groups are incrementally doing a better job than their holdout groups. So both groups will actually be a good, a good group of people to send to. So the key takeaway from this is that incremental values are a really good way for us to see whether we should either send the mail or which group we should send it to. Uh, using the incremental value of A versus the incremental value of B will allow us to know whether we should send to group A, group B, or both. So now that we have explained a little bit about our experimentation, I'm going to talk about some of the metrics that we use. First off, everything that we do has to have statistical significance for us to care about it. I'm not going to go into how uh, the calculations of statistical significance, but I use 95, we usually use 95% confidence intervals to determine that our experiments are actually uh, statistically viable rather than random occurrences. Um, one thing that we notice is that opens and clicks, since they're a binary metric, um, they're easier to actually get uh, statistical significance for. What I mean by a binary metric, it's either the customer either opened the message or they didn't. They either clicked through the message or they didn't. Uh, because of this, it's actually, we can get quick turnaround whether our, 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 our mails are getting engaged uh, properly and whether people are enjoying it. The best way to actually calculate whether our emails are doing good, though, is the monetary value. This is a non-binary metric, which means that we either have to have a higher A-B test, uh, more people in the, in the experiment group, or we have to run it over a longer period of time. Finally, one thing that we do at Amazon.com is something known as uh, site-wide monetary value. This is us comparing one experiment against all of Amazon.com. It'll actually give us some of the best data that we could possibly get. However, it has a lot of noise and it's non-binary. So this usually takes like a month or a year before we can get any sort of statistical significance. There are some negative engagements that we also look at, negative engagement metrics that we also look at. For example, uh, the one that we like to use a lot is opt-out per click ratio. The reason why we use this one is because if the number goes up, that means people are either not enjoying their email or they're not engaging with the email, which is both bad. So it's a very easy way for us to determine whether we're actually sending the right message or not. Finally, uh, we use bounces and complaints that were delivered from Amazon SES. Uh, similar to the notification feedback processor that Morgan uh, was just showing, uh, we are able to take our complaints and make sure that we don't send marketing messages to those addresses again. So tying it all together, Amazon marketing sends a lot of email messages. Uh, because of the planner, our customers love getting the best email that's for them. Uh, we leverage SES feedback loops to allow, our to, tail to allow us to tailor our customer experience. And finally, A-B testing and experimentation are key for us, for, for us to make sure that we send the best message and that we keep the customers happy. All right. Uh, I want to thank you all for coming today. Uh, I hope you enjoyed and take away some stuff from this. We're going to be at the QA booth. Uh, if you guys have any questions, please come find us. We'd love to answer your questions. Thank you.